Hello there, welcome along to Property Kings. My name's John Daly. Now, most people dream about jumping into the property market, but not everyone takes the plunge. Property Kings introduces you to those who have not only jumped in, but are riding the biggest wave, whether excelling in business, services, or just about anything else to do with property. If they're successful, we're bringing you their story. My guest today is Ranjan Bhattacharya. Ranjan, lovely Hi, to meet man. you. Nice to meet you too. You bought your first property at the age of six. <laughs> now, how could that have happened? That's just not right. Surely that's illegal. <laughs> I suppose it is, yes. No, it was Boxing Day. <laughs> I got my first uh, Monopoly set and uh, playing it, one roll of the dice, proud owner of the Angel of Islington. That's what you got? Uh, that's what I got. And, um, you know, ever since then, there seems to have been a poetic logic about doing property to me. <laughs> you know, it just seemed obvious from the Monopoly board that you buy property. I mean, who wins in Monopoly? It's the person who has the most property. Yes. You collect the most rent. Yeah. You make the most cash flow of money win the game. It just seemed logical. And as a child, I was a big Monopoly fan. <laughs> you wasted hours playing Monopoly. Obviously, you didn't waste hours. You put it all to good use, Ranjan, to make a fortune. The rest of us wasted hours. The rest of us sat up till the middle of the night because the game just never ended. But for you, it was research. It was all about building to that project. How did you get involved in the world of real property then? Because you qualified in, what was it, computer science? Yeah, I did computer science. I did, I did my computer science degree. I came out and I got a job. I got a job with a, one of these uh, big consulting companies. And um, I had my contract of employment. Mm -hmm. and, so uh, you were set for life? Well, Pensionable job? Yeah, great. Yeah, great job. You know, good career prospects. And at that time, I was interested in doing that. Uh, it was a good career, it was a very sought after career. Um, so I had my contract of employment and I thought, well, you know, I've got this Monopoly thing in the back of my mind, I've got to have a property. <laughs> you weren't still playing Monopoly, were you? <laughs> well, not at that time, but I, I knew I had to get on the property ladder. So I uh, went out and bought it. And it was just a gut feeling, it was just something just you felt feeling. you had to do. It was, it was yeah, it. yeah, yeah, I just had to do it. I mean, at that time, I, I, was, I bought that first one for my own home. Yes. You know? How so much did it cost? It cost me... Um, Eighty-four thousand pounds. And where was it? It was in Rainers Lane in Harrow. Okay. But not that far from, far from here, I suppose. Yes, that's true. Yes. And how did you, how did you pay for that? Was it because you were on this this high wage as a computer scientist? Well, they gave me. Um, I went to the bank. They gave me a hundred percent mortgage. God bless them. You know, I I done a little bit of. I was a bit of a funny student. I did a bit of share trading and all this sort of stuff, and um, I had some money for a deposit. But at that time, I mean, this was 1990, mm. it was a different time in the property world. Yes. No one was buying property. It certainly wasn't buoyant. Because the crash had just happened, yes. people were very careful, very yes. tentative. Those who were getting into property were doing it because they were well backed. Surely. Absolutely, absolutely. Unlike you. Absolutely. And first time buyers and things, they were just completely scared off. They were renting, they weren't interested. So the banks, I feel, had an attitude that if someone had a, um, you know, is in a reasonable, stable job and wanted to buy property, then they were quite happy to lend. You know, and I fell into that category. So I bought this house, and um, the job that I was in, I didn't know this at the time, but when I joined, it's one of these jobs that send you all over the place. Hmm. Uh, so I got sent all over the place, put up. And did you enjoy that? Was that a good aspect? Oh, it was good fun. Of it? Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, I mean at that stage of my life, early twenties, it was it was the best thing I could have done. Um, but consequently, I was never actually in this house that I bought. <laughs> so the obvious thing to do was to rent it out. And um, at that time, of course, again, it was a different time in the property market also with tenants because um, there weren't enough properties available to let. Hmm. That was a time when you'd advertise a property to let. You'd get five people wanting to take it immediately, you know, and they're racing around to sort of give you the deposit. Um, so we rented it out, found that was relatively easy, and basically thought, well, let's do another one. And so the story continued, I suppose. It's your poetic logic again, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. And so at that stage, did you realize, or realize is the wrong word, did you want it to become a business at that stage, rather than just something you'd fallen into because of circumstances? Now, that's a very, very good question. I thought so. Because, <laughs> because um, really in the first three or four years, probably until about 1995, um, I was focused on my career. Hmm. Um, because you spent a long time training for us. Right? Well, exactly. Yes. And, that's what I, and, and it was good fun. It was very, very enjoyable. But I saw property as a pension. 
I saw it as a, well, 20, 30 years down the line or, you know, because I think in the corporate world, I felt, and I still do feel, it's a very ageist world, the mm. corporate world. I mean, it's, uh, mm. it's very hard to do that well if you've got a lot of grey hairs. Um, so I wanted to have an insurance policy against that. So I was seeing as property as being, you know, several years down the line yeah. in the payback. But then really, I think, um, um, light bulbs lit up in my head around about the mid-90s, which said, property can be a business for the here and now. You know, At that be a stage, anyway. well, what did you have? How many properties did you have and were they all being I think rented I had out? about five or six at that point and they were all sort of buy-to-lets. And, uh, and all within London? Or they're all within London? London, yeah. I adopted a quite different policy in the early 90s because I was in a demanding job. Hmm. And I didn't really have too much time. I thought, let's buy big houses. Because if you buy one big house instead of three or four little flats, you only have one boiler and one set of tenants yes, to, look to look after. Yes, that's right. Um, so that seemed to be, you know, to make sense. So, so how then did you end up with this half dozen? Well, uh, well, that's what I did. I mean, I, because I thought instead of buying lots of little ones, you buy you a few big ones, big ones, and they're easier to manage. But then in the mid '90s, I realised that. Um, property is really more than just a pension. It can actually be a business mm. and it can actually make you money in the here and now. And if you actually think of it like that, then you can actually achieve that. If you think property is a long term and you're not going to make a payback for 20 years, then guess what? That's the sort of investments you'll end up doing. Good grief. Before we move on, I want to talk about your tips because you have given us some tips for getting started in the property business. Indeed, as you've been chatting, you've been giving people advice and tips. But let's, let's talk specifically about these. Number one, select your patch. Don't chase hotspots. Just because the papers write about somewhere, it's absolutely no use to you unless you live close by. Number two, get the knowledge. You just can't figure it out for yourself anymore. Today, the market isn't rising like it was in the boom years. And if you make a mistake, you will lose money. Number three, don't just rely on estate agents to get property deals. Put in place marketing systems to get sellers to call you. You need to get your phone to ring with potential property deals. Number four, remember, you're in the property business. Buying property as an investor is completely different to buying your own home. Professional property investors say, you make your money when you buy, not when you sell. And that's how they do it. That's the close. Number one, select your patch. Don't chase hotspots. Again, it's easy to say, Ranjan, but we all hear what the hotspots are. We all lift newspapers, we're told on the telly, on the radio, Absolutely. wherever. And uh, naturally, that's where we want to go, because that's where the profit is. I think um, the profit can be everywhere, mm. you know, if you look. Uh, the key to it is looking for an area that stacks up and uh, stacks up from the figures point of view. Now, the newspaper might say, you know, Liverpool is a great hotspot yes, and whatever, yes. or whatever it says. That's great if you live near Liverpool, you know, but if you're in Devon or somewhere, you can probably find somewhere that stacks up. I mean, I worked with a, I've worked with a lot of investors um, on my mentorship program and through other sources. And what I find, that unless people are living in the Outer Hebrides, mm. put a pin in the map, hours commuting circle, you can find somewhere that stacks up. And if you find somewhere... And you believe that every kind of urban area has those? Or absolutely, absolutely. I haven't found anyone that hasn't found somewhere within an hour's commuting distance. Mm. And what you'll find is, yes, you might make a marginally more in some of the hot spots, but the extra cost, time and effort in managing property at a great distance will outweigh any sort of extra profit that you might get. And surely there's greater risk in doing it at that sort of distance. Is that fair or am I being naive? Absolutely, because you have to give up a huge amount of control, I suppose, over your investment. Mm -hmm. um, one of the main reasons people um, have chosen to get into property, I find, is that they've lost a lot of trust with managed investments, you know, whether yes. it's pension funds, yes. unit trusts, yes. um, and they want more control, you know, and if you can particularly start out um, within an hour's commuting distance uh, to your own home. You learn a lot. Uh, you, you learn a hell of a lot. And uh, that you can use to sort of build your property business. Mm -hmm. Okay, so keep it close. Number two, get the knowledge. You can't just figure it out for yourself anymore because the market is, I suppose, is volatile a fair word to use for the um, market? I don't think it's volatile. Okay. I think it's just different. I mean. Mm. Again, uh, I'm a great believer in following the property market cycle. 
because it's different strategies that work at different phases of the cycle. Yes. So what I did when I started investing doesn't necessarily work today because we're not at that um, same stage in the cycle. But in the boom years, um, really, you could do anything you want. I mean, I always, uh, I mean, remember the first series of the um, Property Ladder? Yes, yes, show? yes. You know, because the researchers on that show, they go out to find people who make good TV. <laughs> so they might not, you know, they, they want to go their own way and all this sort of stuff. So that's what they do. They go their own way. They never listen to Sarah. And they all make money. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the show, Sarah used to say, um, well, you know, they didn't take any of my, my advice, but they've all made pots of money, but that's because of the rising market. Yes. And that's what you could do in the boom. In the boom, there was, when you've got double-digit growth, there's very little you could do to a property to lose money. Mm. But today it's not like that. You know, if is it riskier? Is it a riskier business to get into? Because again, we're constantly being told that property development is the world for us all to enter. It's, it's risky if you don't have the knowledge. Mm -hmm. If you try to sort of blunder your way through, like people did in the boom, and they made money. Yes. Um, you, you haven't, if you haven't got double-digit growth, there's no sort of uh, margin for error. You can't learn from your mistakes on the back of... Just define double-digit growth. Well, please. back in the boom, you know, property prices in many areas are growing 20%, often 30%. Per year. Yeah, mm. yeah. And if you have made a, made a mistake, say, perhaps you've spent too much money on a refurbishment, perhaps um, you, 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 the time it's taken you has, has sort of doubled, you know, to do, to do the deal. Or you haven't bought so well. You paid too much money when you bought. When you actually sell the property... The fact that the market's grown so much, it's covered up all your mistakes. Mm. So you still come out making money. But that doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. You know, there isn't so that, that safety net yes, for Yes, exactly. That I think insurance. that's the best word for it. Mm. So it's key to um, you know, equip yourself really with the knowledge beforehand. Okay. And We've got a couple more of your tips to discuss, but I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll discuss those after the break, if that's okay, Ranjan. Because, join us after the break, we'll be finding out more about Ranjan Bhattacharya and how you too can become a property king. If you want to find out more about how to be a property king or indeed anything else that we've chatted about so far in the program, you can visit our website, which is OverseasPropertyTV.com. That's OverseasPropertyTV.com. Join us to analyse those tips and much more from Ranjan after this short commercial break.